guys, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Nizazea Ganene, and as you'll see by the title, this is a true crime story. So if that is your vibe, your type of thing, feel free to like, subscribe, and comment on this video. Because as we all know, okay, there is no drama like serial killer drama. So I hope everybody is still having a great week. Um, I don't know what's going on with the weather where I am right now. It's supposed to start being hot girl summer, but winter is throwing a tantrum and she's coming back every other day and she's like, and another thing, okay? Like, we get it, girl, but your time to shine is gone. Just go. <laughs> okay, so today's story is about Daisy Di Malka. And the reason why I chose the story is because I feel like she made history. Wait, I don't feel like she made history. She did make history. A bit of a morbid history, but she did make history as the first woman um, in South Africa to be sentenced to hanging. So it was it was interesting. I thought we should look at the story together and see if that, if that qualified her to be sentenced to hanging, you know? So Daisy was born on the 1st of June, 1886, and she was born in Seven Fountains, which is in Grahamstown. And she was also one of 11 children. When she was just 11 years old, she went to live with her father and two of her brothers in Bulawayo. And then three years later, she was enrolled as a boarder at a seminary school in Cape Town. Okay, uh, I don't know. Like, I wish there was more information about how she lived with her dad and her brothers because it wasn't long after she had actually returned home in 1903 where she was like, uh, this is not for me. I can't do this again. So she enrolls in a nursing school in Bria, Durban. Uh, I think she, she probably was like, I think something, there's a story there. I think there's definitely a story on how she grew up with her brothers, okay? And don't you think it's interesting how a lot of murders and murderers and serial killers, they always have a penchant, a penchant, a, is that the word? <laughs> but they always seem to have, be drawn to medicine, some form, maybe a nurse or a doctor or something and i feel like that's that's something that should be looked into on one of her holidays back home daisy met and fell in love with bert fuller who was a civil servant in the native department at broken hill they had planned to get married on october of 1907 however this did not come to pass as bert unfortunately contracted the black water disease and he died with Daisy by his bedside in the exact day when they were meant to get married. Now, he left her quite a bit of a sum because he left her a hundred pounds. In March of 1909, 18 months after Bert Fuller's death, Daisy married William Cowell, who was a plumber in Johannesburg. At this point, Daisy was 23 years old while William was 36 years old now they got together and created their own little family they had a family of five children however only one survived and his name was Rhodes Cow. early on the morning of 11 January 1923 William became ill after taking Epsom salts prepared for him by his wife now the first doctor who attended to him did not take his condition seriously and so prescribed a bromide mixture for him. However, the first doctor's observation proved to be incorrect as William's situation proved to get progressively worse. So much so that Daisy had to call on her neighbors to come and assist her. And when they reached out to a doctor, by the time he arrived, William was foaming at the mouth and he was blue at the face. And anytime somebody tried to even touch him or um, move him in any way, he would scream at the top of his lungs. This went on until he died. Faced with these symptoms, the second doctor suspected stretchinine poisoning and refused to sign the death certificate. Eventually, a post-mortem was conducted and the district surgeon ruled any foul play 
As a matter of fact, his death was found to be due to chronic nephritis and cerebral hemorrhage. Yeah, basically they said he just bled from the inside. Now, Daisy being his sole beneficiary, she ended up with a inheritance of 1,790 pounds, which today is over 80,000 pounds. At the age of 36 and three years to the exact date when her first husband had met his demise, Daisy married her second husband, and he was also a plumber. Um, he was also 10 years her senior, and his name was Robert Sprout. In October of 1927, Robert became violently ill and experienced the same muscle spasms as Williams had, or rather William had, but luckily for him, he actually survived. A few weeks later, while in the company of his wife and stepson, after having a couple of beers, Robert suffered another attack. Unfortunately, this time he didn't survive and he died on the 6th of November of that same year. Now, the attending physician didn't really perform an autopsy, but he did write on his death certificate that the reason for death was a cerebral hemorrhage. Hemorrhage? That word. <laughs> it's not funny. The word is just really hard to pronounce. But Daisy went on to inherit 4,000 pounds and a further 560 pounds from his pension fund. Today, that amount is over 200,000 pounds. On the 21st of January, 1931, Daisy went on to meet and get married to her third husband, Sidney Demelka. And at this time, Rhodes was 19. Now, what we do have to comment is that Daisy, you could not keep Daisy down. She was about that life. She was about her love life. And she believed in the fairy tale. This is seen by the fact that her third husband was also a plumber. As previously mentioned, Rhodes at this time was all grown up. And if you don't remember who Rhodes is, he was the one and only surviving child from Daisy's first marriage. And a lot of people had different and differing opinions about him. Some said that he was quite lazy and oftentimes did not want to wake up for work. And some said that he was actually an absolute gentleman. Daisy had a different idea about her son. And at this point, it appeared that he was or may have been terrorizing his, his mother for all the inheritance money that she had been getting. Whatever the case is, in February of 1932, Daisy traveled from Germiston to Trafontaine to obtain a quantity of arsenic from a chemist there. Now, what was suspicious about that was that she used her old surname, which was Sprout. But as for the reason why she needed this quantity of arsenic, she simply put down that she wanted to destroy or put down a sick cat. Two weeks later, after Daisy's trip, on the 2nd of March, 1932, Rhodes fell violently ill after drinking from a flask that his mother had prepared for him. He was also with a co-worker named, named James Webster, who had also taken a bit of a sip from the content of the flask. They were both very sick. However, James recovered just a few days later. However, Rhodes died the next Saturday at midday at his home. After his death, a postmortem was done on Rhodes's body and they found or ruled his death as a cerebral malaria. Not really sure how they got to that conclusion, but that is what they said and that was their story and they stuck to it. Upon his death, Daisy inherited a hundred pounds, which as we know today is over 14,000 pounds. By this time, William Sprout, Daisy's previous brother-in-law, um, he had become quite suspicious. So upon realizing his suspicions, he simply reached out to the authority. On the 15th of April, investigators 
got a court order to be able to exhume the bodies of William Cow, Road Cow, and Robert Sprout. Upon these bodies being recovered, they were found to be in an unusually good state of preservation, which is consistent with arsenic being present in large quantities. An analyst was also called over to take a look at the bodies and test parts of the bodies, like the bone and hair. And he was also able to verify that there was um, quite a bit of arsenic in the bodies. Mind you, James Webster was also called in to be tested and they were able to find traces of arsenic under his fingernails. A week later, Daisy was apprehended and arrested. Now, this case gained quite a bit of recognition. Um, newspaper articles wrote all about it. And it got to a point where even the chemist from Telfrontaine was able to recognize Daisy. And upon realizing where she would have gotten the arsenic, he went straight to the police and was able to actually be a witness. Daisy's trial lasted for 30 days. To present the forensic evidence, the Crown invited Dr. J.M. Watt, a expert toxicologist and a pharmacological professor at the University of the Witwatersrand. At the end of Daisy's trial, although the judge ruled that the evidence was inconclusive for William Carl's death as well as Robert Sprout's death, it was undoubtedly Rhodes that Daisy had killed. For this crime, she was sentenced to hanging and this was done, or rather, she was hung on the 30th of December of 1932. This set off quite a bit of talk and of course, like I previously mentioned, she was the first woman to be sentenced to a hanging. Now, I want to know your opinion. What do you think made her do it? Remember when I said that it may have been how she grew up with her brothers and her dad? Maybe some shadow was there and she didn't actually like having men in her life because it just doesn't make sense. Or did she just really enjoy the thrill of having the money but not the husband? Now you'd have to remember that this was in the between 1920 to 1932. At the time, there weren't a lot of rights for women. So did she do it because of that? Did she want her freedom but knew she couldn't have it? So she just used her husband as a kind of buffer, buying herself time until she was old enough to not be expected to have a husband? Or was she really just that, that much of a monster and just wanted money the whole time? Tell me your thoughts. The comments are always open.